Yeah, yeah, thank you to the organizers for um, taking, uh, inviting me um, to present here. And uh, weather is much better than in Boston at this time of the year, so I'm very happy to be here. And um, yeah, what I would like to talk about is part of a bigger program that we've been trying to pursue over the last um, three years. It'll probably take us at least another three years to complete. But the basic goal is to develop a framework that works across a range of organisms and systems and um, allows us to do inference, model inference, basically from videos. So I'll show videos of these um, various examples and I will also describe some more detail throughout the talk, but just briefly as an orientation. So here we have a green alga. Um, this is the elegans. This is, uh, I think we all know what that is by now. So, and this is a jellyfish. Uh, and, and these data that I will talk about in more detail, they are provided by our collaborators. And um, the general idea is really to take videos that they give us, plus some extra information, and try to translate it into quantitative models. And what I'll talk about is a module, basically, on that, on that path. So what I'll do um, today is um, I'll spend some time and uh, describe the experiments at some very high level so that you have an idea um, what drives us. Then I will talk a little bit about the the theoretical and computational approaches and um, we'll then go on and provide some examples. So I'll talk a little bit about how we can use spectral representations um, to um, extract time-resolved dispersion relations of um, living systems. I think that's actually a bit more than you would typically do in a condensed matter system where you get a stationary dispersion relation. But um, here we can actually say at a given point in time where the organism is basically on the dispersion relation. And then I will talk at the very end if Jiram gives me some time to talk about um, ODE and SDE inference at a very high level and show some preliminary results. Good. Good. So the Motivation really to pursue the program comes from the experimental data provided by our collaborators and typically these data are very high dimensional. So very often we get now videos that can be of the order of gigabytes and in addition we'll also get other information. So that may either be a second video taken at a different resolution or with a different, um, in a different channel that provides some biological information. So you may see an organism move but you may also see some signaling going on for example. But from a mathematical perspective, so these are all tensor structures. So just arrays of, of numbers in a way. And sometimes we also get um, extra information that may be, um, for example, gene expression or something else, or that may come in some you know, other table form. But fundamentally, we, we have the question, how can we take some tensorial data and translate it into systems or models that we can interpret? So the first step that we always try to um, do now is that also has practical, a practical need for it, is to translate the pixel data that we get, and it's just it's a matter of how the microscope is constructed, into some lower dimensional representation that will lose some of the fine-grained information, but hopefully keeps what we care about. And of course, what we care about is a bit subjective. Okay. And once we have that lower dimensional representation, we will try to translate that into um, predictive models. Good. So I'll talk a little bit about experiments and um, just to give you some examples, there are more obviously we're interested in. So this is um, pterosperma, so it's actually a green alga, so it has um, several of um, cilia. But here basically they form a bundle and then you see this wavy motion. And so this data is, um, was uh, taken by uh, um, Alex Borgon in, in Kirsty Banks lab at Exeter University. And here you see already that something changes in the dynamics. So it's quite remarkable because it's a single cell organism, so it can exhibit various behaviors. But one of the questions that Kirsty and Alex was asking us, so how many behaviors do we see in that video? And they have many more of this type. So how can you find a good way of classifying these behaviors? Then there are, of course, more the biological or biophysical questions. So how are these transitions between different behaviors controlled? What is actually the dynamics? So here um, we will look at the modes and can we infer a dynamical system for, for these type of dynamics? And also something about dispersion relations maybe that relates more to the question that you would ask for as in condensed metaphysics, for example. Good. So very different system biologically, but um, geometrically somewhat similar. So here you can see a worm crawling. And it is a video taken by Stephen Flavel. So here we have already extracted the midline. So it's a pretty boring part of the dynamic. It does many, many more things. But the really interesting part is this additional data that we get. So these are neurons. So they're about basically half of the neurons that the worm has. And what Stephen's lab can do is they can record the activity of the neurons as the organism moves. And so one of the first questions is, so given 
these firing patterns, and we will actually ask a simpler question later, so it's given just a few neurons that we know that are uh, responsible for locomotion, can we predict what the behavior would look like, the dynamics, the physical dynamics, are given neuron patterns, for example. Good. So these are one-dimensional, I mean, for biologists, they're not one-dimensional, for me, they're pretty much one-dimensional objects, um, but you have similar data um, in higher dimensions, so this is um, a jellyfish, so this type of jellyfish is about centimeter or so in, in size. And um, what you will see in a moment that this grid deforms. So in these experiments, the jellyfish, so the experiments are performed by Brady Weisbrot in MIT Biology. And what you can see is that um, the jellyfish here is deforming. So we overlay the grid, we projected it on a disk. So that's a very crude simplification, but for us it's challenging enough at the moment. And again, as this deformation happens, so we can observe how the neurons fire. So it's a similar question. It's a very different biological system, but you see there's some structural similarity in the, in the question that you try to answer from a modeling perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and then there is this other two-dimensional example, which we have seen many times before, where you can also ask so what's the dynamics, basically, of these type of um, um, assemblies of, of embryos that exhibit collective behaviors. Yeah. And here are also the questions. You could, for example, mix different um, embryos at different stages of development. You can ask what's the dynamics there and so on. So ideally, we would like to take these type of videos and translate them at some point directly into a predictive model. Good. So what are the challenges? So the first thing, what I already mentioned, is that we would like to identify a suitable set of collective variables. In physics, you would probably call them slow variables. You can also ask about the properties of the noise on top of those. It's a bit more challenging, but in principle doable. We would use those, like to use those variables to characterize um, and also identify different biological states, uh, different types of behaviors, and then we would translate them into an inference framework. And I think something that I would like to um, emphasize here is ideally we want to have an inference framework that makes life for experimentalists easier. So it's very hard if you have an even an active nematic theory or so to measure all the parameters in an actual experiment. So for hydro-ordinary fluids, you can maybe build a real meter and you measure the viscosity, but once you have, you know, a system that has five relevant parameters, so it's very hard to figure out if you design a certain apparatus what it actually measures. So if you could take a video and you could infer all the parameters directly, so I think that would make life easier. Good. So the way we go about it is typically we um, first take um, synthetic data, so that's important um, to test the pipelines, and then afterwards experimental data. And as I mentioned, uh, it is typically given in some sort of tensorial form, and we tr try to compress it by various means, so there are many different methods out there. So what we try to do is, um, at the moment, our focus on is mostly uh, linear um, transformations. If you, for example, you can think of these here being Fourier orthogonal basis systems, and then this little blob basically is the compressed bit. These are the Fourier coefficients that you would have to drag along, so you can think of one dimension, for example, being time, the others being space, but could be something more abstract. So we use those for compression. That's very um, relevant to get just sometimes uh, movies or the data from our experimental collaborators onto our desktops. Um, we also use these type of representation for denoising and interpolation, and also for computing um, derivatives, for example. So if you want to learn differential equation system, and you want to use an algorithm that um, uses derivatives at some point, it's very hard to do finite differences on experimental data and then get anything reasonable out. So if you have a compression, basically in terms of some, say, Fourier basis or some other orthogonal basis system, you just do the differentiation on the basis and everything is basically um, exact at that level. It also basically um, tells us typically, so this type of decomposition, what type of modeling framework we should look for. So if you have to keep a large number of modes, so your block C is essentially as large as your original system, so you may need a PDE actually in real space and you can't do anything. If you can get away and get a good recovery of the original signal with just a finite number of modes, then you may be able to get away with an ODE system in mode space. Yeah. So once we have this um, representation, we um, put them into our model inference um, framework. So there are various approaches. We have already heard about Cindy yesterday. So, um, but um, you can also look at other types of um, approaches where you think about 
structure, uh, structure of matrix factorization, so I'll talk a little bit about it later in one example. What we have mostly uh, transitioned to recently is Bayesian inference. We found that to be much more robust than Zindi, for example, and also sensitivity methods, so where you actually integrate solutions forward and you fit basically two data along the way and you use automatic differentiation. And the output then is typically an ODE, so SDE or PDE, and what's really important is then to simulate these type of, of models in um, basically forward under different conditions to see if they actually give you predictions beyond basically the training data or training setting. Good, so what I'll talk about now is just the first part. Um, so the spectral representation, maybe at the end a little bit about the inference for a couple of examples. So and I come back to um, the um, terror framer behavior and the theoretical analysis here was performed by Alistair Haskell, is a, a recent PhD student from my group who is now in Chicago at the new Institute for Theoretic Theory and Mathematics of Biology, I think. Good, so this is a video that I already showed. So you see the organism moving. So again, we have many of those and some they show more complex behavior. So I use that as an example and, and briefly flash some data that comes from a larger set of experiments. The way we get the data is typically in terms of some sort of tracking of the filament. So say you give us 100 points here along the line. So typic, uh, along the, um, the, I will talk of that just as a like jello mozilla here. There's actually a bundle. So if you, if you give us 100 points, if it comes to you try to learn an ODE system for these 100 points in a more 100 dimensional space. And that typically doesn't work because you don't have enough data and it's just too high dimensional. So what you can do is you can parameterize these type of fairly regular motions using um, orthogonal basis functions. So what you pick basically depends on the system as your basis. Um, here we use Chebyshev polynomials. You can also take the jungle polynomials. Chebyshev are nice for a variety of reasons. So if you want to compute derivatives and so on, so you take very simple, um, the form of very simple matrix operations. But what you see here is that with just basically 10 modes, you pretty much get perfect recovery in that state. So instead of looking at a system, say that is as 100 points in position space, you only have 10 dimensional system mode space. And if you're happy with an approximation that is not quite as good, you probably could get away with five. So, good. so let me play basically um, this video again. So what you can see here in the middle is now the angle. So here I just focus on shape dynamics. You can also do the translational dynamics, but for simplicity, let's focus on the shape. So this is basically what the shape, the angle, local tangent angle looks as a um, function of arc length over time. And now you can do this decomposition and I will use many of these um, graphical illustrations of these decompositions. So you have the first coefficient, it's like a Fourier coefficient that tells you something about the mean angle, this tells you something about curvature, this tells you something about higher curvature moment and so on. And as basically you um, evolve in time, these coefficients have a time evolution. And if you look at those, you can already see quite clearly that there are probably two and a half behaviors here. And so there's something here, there's something here, and then there's some transition in between. So a type of spectral representation gives you already a nice um, signature. So now what we do is we take these new um, mode coefficients as our primary variables, and we perform now um, wavelet analysis, so using, there's a really nice paper here, so if you want to apply these methods, or that for us made a huge difference. Um, and um, yeah, so we look at the um, wavelet transforms, and it's essentially like a window Fourier transform with a Gaussian, so it's like a sinusoidal sino function with a um, Gaussian window. So if you now do the wavelet transform, so what you get as a function of time for each of these modes, a frequency spectrum instantaneously. So you see here clear, very clearly that, for example, the first mode, which describes curvature, basically is in a certain frequency state, and then something happened, and it becomes very weak. So the color basically shows intensity here at the given frequency, intensity of power. And then you see that the higher modes basically get much more, more power in these. So what you can do is you can take your original dynamics, which happens in that video in a second here, and you can translate it into this vector of modes at basically different um, waveforms at different points in time. So and that's basically essentially a time-resolved dispersion relation. So if you integrate over time, you get the dispersion relation back that uh, 
um, organism that's visited. So what you can do now is you can take these vectors to characterize busy at a given point in time, so these long vectors, as your state variable, just to get do classification, and you can just measure some sort of distance between those and embed these distance matrices in some low-dimensional space. And here you see what a distance matrix for this video looks like, so it's really nicely clustered, so you see that there is basically the two types of behaviors in the video, and then there's a small um, transition region, and you see that basically in this behavioral base spaces. So MDS here just means multidimensional scaling, which is a form of principal component, basically representation, but you use this uh, given distance matrix that not necessarily has to be Euclidean. Good, so this is just a two-dimensional representation um, for this video. I told you we have many of these, so you can try to embed those in a similar way, and this is, um, basically what you get if you choose a three-dimensional representation of all the videos that we have. And that starts to look a little bit like a Lorentz or Bristol type attractor. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, very prelim preliminary, so we hope we can improve that a little bit further, but it gives us an idea that there's, you know, a certain dimensionality. So here the two dimensions actually are somewhere between four or so and five, so somewhere between three and five. So it depends on how much variance you want to capture. So the first three, um, dimensions give us across all the data 90% of the um, variability, which is, I mean, significant. And so what the organism now does is basically it somehow evolves along this attractor. And what you would try to do later on is to get an equation that tells us something about this evolution. Good. Yeah, so just to um, now um, show the, the, what the dynamics look like in terms of these new variables. So this is, again, for the straight swimming video that I showed. So the color codes and codes time, so at early times you have a certain waveform, basically the organism moves and then it stalls and goes to a different waveform, so this is just shown here in terms of position and here in um, terms of the waveforms. And what I plot here, basically as pairwise plots, are just the different modes as pairwise phase diagrams or phase space plots, and you can see that in certain modes basically you have these oscillations and once the behavior changes you go to a different um, state. And what we would like to do ideally is learn a dynamical system from data for this type of dynamics. So that's a, a long-term goal. And we made some progress recently, but for lower dimensions. You can do the same then for other types of behavior during turning. And you, so the only thing I want you to take away that the dynamic changes basically in these different regimes. So you have to think about basically how you incorporate it into a single model, for example. Good. So everything what I've shown here on a, on a theoretical level or computational level is easily transferable to other systems. You just have to pick a basis that's appropriate for your um, system under consideration and then you can compute these type of spectra. So I'll just show very briefly an application to um, NICTAS data. So this is now in a regime where you transition from this basically nice vertical rotation to this um, precession motion. And then you see um, how the um, basically dynamic changes a little bit. And what you can do is by tracking the positions of these um, embryos and assigning a graph structure to them, you can um, define a basis system and then basically do um, similar analysis. So that's what I mean by being transferable. So you just adapt the basis pretty much to, to the system. So here basically is in representation, I think Nick that showed it already. So I just want to introduce that type of notation. I will use it later on for in the inference framework for one-dimensional system as well. So as long as you deal with two-dimensional systems, so it's sometimes very convenient to um, express things in a complex form, where we take the x-coordinate of the nth embryo in our system as um, the real part and the vertical coordinate as the uh, imaginary part. And in that case, so we perform simply a um, dynamical mode decomposition, which uh, if you, if you want to see basically a nice um, optimized um, DMD algorithm, so it's in the paper by Nathan Katz here or in the, in the book actually, so the original paper. And what that does is basically it decomposes the time series of this type into a frequency part that encodes um, oscillatory dynamics and there is a damping part that tells you something about the dissipation in the system and then there are spatial modes. So if you apply the DMD mode, uh, or the D and B composition, so these modes will actually be not orthogonal. So there's kind of dual approaches. So what you can also do is you can take, um, say, the graph Laplace, and I'll come back to that in a second, and then do a wavelet analysis to get an approximation to this type. So that depends a little bit sometimes on the quality of the data and what you want to emphasize. 
So what you can see here in these data is that a nine, maybe let me just play the movie again. So this is the full experimental data. This is a reconstruction with just nine modes, so it's already much lower dimensional. So I don't know how many embryos we have, but probably of the order of a few hundred or so. But you go down to nine and you capture quite a bit. Um, if you want to see something about 40, I think you have to talk to Shreyas mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Oshiram now. So, <laughs> so there's, a, a, for example, a dominant global rotation in that early stages of the dynamics, and then you see acoustic modes and optical modes and so on, and you can analyze the, the spectral properties. So just to show you, so these uh, mode representation for these type of dynamics, they do quite well. So this is in a comparison. You pick a single embryo, and you look at the x and the y coordinate of the embryo, and you look at how well you reconstruct if you just take nine modes, so that's the red curve. And that's, I mean, reasonable, and if you want to do better, say if you go to 40 modes, so then you get almost perfect recovery. So that it depends on, on you know, how accurately you want to capture. So it's a trade-off between the dimensionality that you want to keep and the accuracy. Good, so just um, to, to briefly explain how we get from this mode decomposition to a spectrum or the dispersion relation. So what we do in that case is we track all the embryos and we, there are sometimes embryos that escape basically from the tissue or the, or the material, I should say material is not a tissue. And what we can do is we can take these that stay over, you know, the duration of the video in the frame and we use those as basically vertices of a um, graph. Now, um, where you have these holes, so these are places where an embryo has escaped occasionally. So what you can do is you can um, define, if you want to have a nice set of modes in that, that is interpretable, you can look at the Laplacian of that graph. And in that case, we take a Laplacian that's called the cotangent Laplacian. It's a large matrix that also accounts for the angles, basically, because you see that in some cases you don't have regular angles, so you want to correct for that. And we want to implement a scale as well. So what you can do is you can assign for each to each of these nodes. So if you look here, the corresponding area by looking at the dual uh, Voronoi lattice of the Delaunay triangulation, and you get basically a scaled Laplacian that has dimensions of length. Once you have that, you can look at the eigenfunctions of that Laplacian, and what you see here that these are first, uh, they're very similar to the Fourier Bessel function that you see, and so you have a, now a scale associated with this because the area has a number. So the scale here is simply the square root of the eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Good, so this gives us an orthogonal basis. Now what we can do is we can take that Laplacian and we can now take our DMD basis, basically, and project it against the Laplacian, and it gives us something like a mean wave number, basically, for each, um, yeah. And then we can measure the frequencies and for those. And those are the plots that Nikta already showed. And what you find is that depending on which state you're in, if you're in a pure spin state, you don't see the optical um, band. But once you go to um, basically this uh, processing state, and you start to see the optical band as well. And if you take more modes, you get more points here. And as you take more modes, so the, um, you have to be more and more careful with how you um, um, estimate your, your mode coefficients, basically, because these are more affected by noise, typically. Okay. Good. Yeah, so if you want to see the 40 mode results, go to Shreya's poster. Good. Good. So um, just very briefly, so this generalizes across um, systems now. So if you want to deal with jellyfish, you take, uh, for example, Fourier Jacobi basis functions of this type. You decompose your, your shape deformation and also your, your neural activity. Or if you want to do tissue dynamics on, you know, something that's roughly a spherical egg or a surface or egg yolk, then you can use uh, spherical harmonics, vector spherical harmonics, and then do everything in these mode spaces. So we try to build, build these pipelines in a way that we can take a module and we choose the right basis, and then maybe the back end is, would be somewhat similar for all of those. Good. So now for the last few minutes, maybe a little bit about model inference. So um, there are different methods of doing model inference. So I think the traditional one is Cindy, which was increment-based. And there are various weak formulations where you integrate over your um, equations of motions and um, also basically estimate parameters. You can do um, other methods. And I just outline two um, very briefly here. So those are the most basic ones. So just most of you probably know that by now, but maybe it's useful to summarize it. So if you look for deterministic models, for example, an ODE, so think about these X variables now being our state variables. They are the mode coefficients. Good. 
perfect. Um, so these could be our uh, mode coefficients, and we would like to learn basically a first order differential equation, for example. So what we can do is we can think about writing this differential equation in a discretized form because the data, for example, comes in, in increments. And then we try to minimize basically. So the function f here is where we put in our um, basically series expansion for the force fields or whatever basically the relevant um, dynamical um, flow fields are. Here, I would just generally, if you, if you want to do this, I would always recommend not to use um, polynomial expansions. We did that early on. It was stupid in hindsight. So what we should have done right from the start is use um, orthogonal polynomials, um, which are much more robust and, and avoid sloppiness, these kind of things. And then you try to minimize, basically, this type of function with respect to your parameters. And you may impose extra constraints, like symmetries, which basically put parameters to zero in the space of all possible functions. And um, yeah, you may impose sparsity or some other sort of structure. So what we found actually more fruitful more recently is to go directly to um, SDEs. Um, and so I just sketch here basically how you can think about it. So this is essentially a limit case of this, uh, if, you, if you want to reinterpret. So this is a stochastic differential equation um, with here just basically a Brownian noise. We can do the same for other types of noise. So we have one paper on the archive where we use a Poisson driving process, but the procedure is generally the same. So the way you can think about it at a very basically rough level is if you solve that for dB in some form, then you know what the statistics of dB is. So now, given data, basically for dx and, and these f's, you try to find your parameters so that distribution matches that distribution. And you can do that in many different ways, but that's at a very high level. And there are then clever ways of doing it, not so clever ways and robust ways. But those are the ideas. Good. So let's um, very briefly look at a linear model for worms, and then let's look for the last few minutes at a nonlinear model. So, so again, so the, these are the um, data that I already showed. So that's the elegance moving. And we transform it here. So we parameterize it as a curve. So there's an x coordinate that changes along the arc length and time, and a y coordinate that changes along the arc length and time. We choose here again a um, Chebyshev polynomial basis with respect to the arc length. So this is how they look. So the first mode is just something like the average position. Second one gives you the end-to-end uh, -end orientation roughly. The third one gives you the first bending mode, and so on. And you get these coefficients by integrating the sum weight function basically against these basis function. So your new variables are these um, mode coefficients. And now what you could try to do is you can ask oh, how well basically does a linear model do on these type of data. So what you would try to solve for is this matrix M given data for these modes and their time derivatives. So if you do that in a naive way, so you, you typically, I mean that is a not so difficult problem. So you get something that works quite well on a specific training set. But when you now choose or use that matrix that you've learned, and you try to apply it to a different set of initial condition. You try to see, look, see what the motion looks like. It usually doesn't work. So it, um, you have overfitted typically to your data set. So what you try to impose is some structure. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can say the system should be rotational invariant. So you can actually do that in a very nice way in a complex um, formulation. But um, here I just show it in terms of matrices. So what you see, if you impose rotational invariance, of your system, so that makes this matrix M simpler, so you impose structure on the matrix, also reduce the number of parameters. If you do that, what will happen is once you simulate the system, typically there will be some eigenvalues of positive or negative real part, so your ground will start to shrink or to grow, which is not super desirable. So you can impose basically one extra constraint that the length should be conserved, and you can basically formulate it as an additional basically constraint and it essentially imposes extra structure on these um, matrices where you can now write this matrix in terms of a factorization where you have a matrix that's essentially a metric that you can compute from the basis that you've chosen, so that's given, that's not something that's fitted. And these other matrices that you have to fit to the data have to be excuse the metric. Okay. Now, when you rewrite this in a complex form, so that just becomes a Schrödinger equation in shape space plus an extra equation because you have a length constraint is a linear dynamics. It's in two dimensions, so you can define these wave functions just in those forms. So it's really mathematically it's the same. Huh? So you can then do a lot of stuff that people have developed for um, these type of systems and apply them to study behavior. 
This is just basically how well such a model does on a short segment of a trajectory. So it's not too bad, basically, for a learned matrix. And then you could, for example, if you want to stick with linear models, you can take them or stack them, basically, and yeah, study things. And, and the nice thing about this is, this is something I want to emphasize, you can apply it to various systems. So you, because the basis is generic, so we applied it to a desert snake, and then my student asked me for some money, and I bought him a toy snake. Um, so, and we basically analyze those in the same framework. So here you can see the Hamiltonians corresponding to those. And so. Yeah, and the one thing I, yeah, good. Yeah, I'm almost done, good. Well. Or somebody, I can stop here, and somebody asked me about the nonlinear inference, so we can do it this way. <laughs> let's do it, let's do it this way, okay. Good, so then let's me just wrap up here. So what we can do with this linear representation is now compare the Hamiltonians. So what we've done is that you take different organisms, the dynamics of different organisms, map them on matrices, and then it's just basically comparing behaviors comes down to comparing matrices. And you can then basically plot various organisms in some sort of phase diagram, which comes basically from a distance matrix that compares these Hamiltonians. And then you see that a toy snake really doesn't resemble a toy snake. It's as close to a snake as to a worm, for example. So people should try to improve that. But it's a very nice way, basically, of compressing behaviors into just a matrix and then doing some analysis. Good. I, I will stop here. Yeah. And then and let's, let's thank you all. Yeah. And Can you tell us more about the nonlinear part of this? <laughs> thank you, Stan. I pay you it later. <laughs> OK. OK, good. Yeah, so. so and this is really, um, I mean, what we currently work on. So these linear models, so they work nicely on short segments. And you can think of them as linearizations of a more complex, um, 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 basically nonlinear model. So what we have been now trying to do is to come up with a model where we can feed in a neural signal and we get a motion out. And hopefully that motion will basically then resemble what the biologists see in the experiments. So we use the same decomposition as before. So here we took the jungle polynomials. Here are just time series of these mode coefficients for these first three shape or first four shape coefficients. And you can see um, that when you have, for example, here this turning behavior, so you have an omega turn, you get a spike, for example, or large value in, in this curvature component and so on. Now, when we do nonlinear SDE inference on these type of time series data, this is what you get. So here's a comparison. On the bottom left, you see phase diagrams that come from experiments, where we plot these modes relative to each other. So we have time series for all of those. We can see, so for example, in the um, was it theta 3, theta 4, so in the second and third component, you see this nice limit cycle and so on. And then the top right, you see what the nonlinear um, SDE model gives us. So that looks um, pretty reasonable. So if you show the same for a linear model, so it wouldn't work. So you would see these type of limit cycles, for example. But the key thing for us is that because the data is limited, so it's really expensive to do these experiments, is to come up with a clever decomposition. And what we do is essentially we augment the linear model that I've shown before with an additional nonlinearity that essentially corresponds then to a hodge helmholtz decomposition of these flow fields. So the C part is what I've shown you before. So that's a linear part that is essentially a curl field in the dynamic system context. And then you can get this gradient approximately very nicely from the stationary distribution. So if you actually look at the dynamics, you see these type of limit cycles. So on these curves, so the system actually propagates in this form, and there is basically this potential that pushes you onto the limit cycle. So that's the last thing um, to answer Sehan's question. <laughs> so, so, we can <laughs> so we can take that model and um, basically put in a neural signal. So here are four neurons that are known to be relevant for locomotion. We translate them into um, latent variables. So these Zs here are both the parameters for the um, actual physical system and then also the behavioral state. And then we can predict from these type of dynamics what the mode dynamics should look like. So that's, of course, a stochastic prediction because we get the, um, we have a, a SDE model. But we can compare these then with the experiments. And you see it's actually reasonably, I mean, qualitatively close. And we have done more um, analysis on those. But I think it's quite encouraging. So you can take, in that case, really, basically, that type of pipeline and um, plug in 
neural signals and you can get a movie out that tells you how the worm should move. And then you can see if you take more modes, whether it works better and so on. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I was wondering, have you uh, tried, instead of inferring, um, as you mentioned, the SDE sort of on an uh, SDE level, uh, to use these optimal transport-based techniques to infer sort of the corresponding Fokker-Planck uh, equation directly? Is this maybe more robust? Or does this SDE inference uh, that you showed work work pretty well? Well, the SDE, we found the SDE works, works the best in terms of um, both uh, numerical stability, so if you use, uh, so Bayesian basically um, inference with a sparsity promoting priors, so that worked best, best for us. It also, I think it's uh, more efficient in terms of data, so to map out Fokker-Planck equation space, so you need a lot of data. So I know, I mean, I think Greg Stevens has done, tried things along those lines, so it's doable. But um, once you have an SDE, I mean, you can always write down the, Fokker-Planck a priori, so in that sense, if you could learn the Fokker-Planck equation, it would be equivalent sure, in terms sure, of sure. results, but the, the, the question is really numerics. just what works better for the amount of data that you have available. So the Fokker-Planck equation, I mean, so if you go to these uh, PDE descriptions, so the advantage is that everything is linear and you just deal with linear operators, but you need a lot of data, and so there's always a price that you have to pay. So. Mm -hmm. That's your All right. um, so I was I have sort of two related questions. So one is, you're, you're sort of assuming here that the observed degrees of freedom, like in, in the shape, are basically all the degrees of freedom you, you need to actually predict the, the dynamics of the system. So it doesn't have any sort of hidden internal states that are, that are relevant. And sort of related to that, you already mentioned Greg Stevens. He has this idea of, of using delay embeddings to basically get around this issue that you observe only a subset of the actual dynamical degrees of freedom of the system, so sort of how does this relate to what you've been doing here? Yeah, I mean, so here in the examples I talked about, so I really assume basically that what we see is, you know, what we want and, and so on. So you can do the same here um, using the, uh, with hidden variables, at least in reasonably low dimensions. So if you say you miss one or two observables, you can do exactly basically the same approach on a dynamic systems level, so that what you do is, you do the, I mean, time delay embeddings, and then that tells you the number of um, basically observables that you would roughly need. And if you have only measured two, then you can try to add, take on. So we have applications to that, and including also to experimental data in this article, which should come out in two weeks or so. We just returned the proofs, but the version is on here. So you can do hidden field inference. Um, yeah, so it, I mean it's doable, but it's doable if the dimensions, I mean, so if you have just two observables and you, you know, they have 10 missing, so it's probably not going to work. So if you have a Lorentz system, for example, so you can, if you have two, you can exactly recover the third one. If you have only one, in, in our studies, you can recover a dynamic system that is on a Lapunov time scale, indistinguishable, but may have a couple of extra terms, but it may still be good enough if that, you happy with that? So there's some yeah, restriction. Um, so uh, I'm going to use a word that uh, I've heard neuroscientists use before, but I don't fully understand, and that's a neural circuit. Uh, and just as how you were able to take a complicated in real space, uh, you know, a flagellar trajectory, for example, uh, and decompose it into modes, uh, is it possible to take your complicated neural, n neuronal activation patterns and decompose that into <coughs> modes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, exactly what we've been trying to do um, originally. And we haven't found a good um, low dimensional representation of that pattern yet. So what we did is, um, this, um, what's it called? Um, it's basically optimal basis pursuit, so where you can take um, um, basically many basis systems that are non-orthogonal. You try to get the best fit basically on the data. You subtract it from your data and you go to the next and so on. So. We, we weren't really successful, so that's why we took a step back actually and said for the last thing that I showed, so let's focus just on four neurons. So my hope is what will eventually happen, but that, I mean, may just be a pipe dream, so I don't know. So that there are a couple of neurons that act like generals, so that are really important to keep them as individual entities. And the other neurons, so maybe you can treat them as soldiers that perform some collective motion. So you would have it's a, a split in terms of,
basically you keep some neurons as individual variables and then you have collective variables. So you do that sometimes when you do an eval decomposition also when you do simulations also where you take the fine scale structure, you keep something and then you do large scale, basically you choose a Fourier basis and so on. But that hasn't been super successful yet. So we had some success by keeping the neurons, but my hope is really that we don't need to know all the 305 neurons to make predictions. So something like pacemaker cells uh, and then the other cells around them that follow. Exactly, it's, cool. a, it's a same idea. So it's so these type of bases, decomposition, the way I think about them is more from a programmatic point of view. So you want to reconstruct a signal and you have to say, oh, if I somehow transform it to some other basis, so do I gain something in terms of compression? Uh -huh. so, and if I don't, then I have to basically keep all the particles, basically coordinates, so which would be here, all the neural coordinates. But my hope is still that these organisms function if you remove some of the not so important neurons. So and that would suggest then that in that case you can maybe take those as part of a collective variable and reduce dimensionality. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and this is a similar question from how you're mapping neural patterns onto movement patterns. And I'm just curious if your math tells you, so you said you had to introduce this nonlinearity, if that also um, is something that you can understand how that might occur in the actual C elegance. Um, is there some kind of integration of the activity or some kind of passing on a movement from the neurons into the muscles that um, sort of makes sense for the kinds of uh, nonlinearities that you're having to put into your system? So here I, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you yet, so that's too, too recent. So, so what we have, so we now start to talk to Ila Fite and so about, about basically interpretations and also Stephen. I mean the nonlinear part here is actually quite simple. It's, so what the community has done for quite some time is mapping linear models of this type and so on, but what they also have known is so once you take those and you try to simulate them forward, they don't give you anything that looks like a worm and you can see that quite easily. So I took that slide out, but as you see that these don't, don't fit basically anymore. So the, the way we do it is really just, we take basically the gradient of this uh, likelihood function here more or less, and so this gives you the confining potential. Huh? So, and this basically stabilizes the dynamics enough so that you get a model to um, be on that limit cycle. So my assumption would be that somehow there are physical constraints encoded here. So a linear model allows you to do all sorts of crazy dynamics, but then there may be something in the organism that actually constrains that. But I don't, can't give you a satisfactory ex explanation of what exactly that might be. Um, yeah, do you like have a systematic way to determine how many modes you're going to use? Because uh, you said you use nine and Shreyas uses like yeah. 40. Yeah, so, so you can do that. Um, so, I mean, there are different ways of doing it. So one is, for example, you take um, half your data, typically. You fit basically the mode coefficients and you see how well do you predict on the other half of the data. What's the compression? And then you may find an optimum <laughs> there. But on the other hand, you can also simply say, I'm happy with 90% recovery. I'm happy with 70% recovery. I'm happy with, you know, 99% recovery. And that tells you. But what I would always recommend is to, to split the data. So you fit on one part and you see how good does it compress on the other part that it hasn't seen. And then if you're lucky, you see basically there's a clear optimum in terms of number of modes where you go from overfitting or towards overfitting. Yeah, so I'm curious if you could skip your um, was a dimensional reduction or compression segment by either um, using something like diffusion, diffusion maps, like a nonlinear dimensional reduction approach yeah. that will give you the modes, or even jumping it all together and doing an AI training and looking at the latent space. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. So the reason why we do in this form, so I like things that are still somewhat interpretable, mm -hmm. because uh, there's, there's always a straight off. I mean, here I can understand what in every step Mm -hmm. So what type of reduction I've made. So what I can't understand necessarily is then in the end immediately, so what the nonlinearity in the mode equation actually mm -hmm. translates to. So that's, that's thing. If I start doing the, um, automa I mean, dimensional reduction using autoencoders or whatever you, you want to do, so you lose that piece of interpretability. Mm -hmm. And then at some point there's the question, yeah, why not simply take a neural net and mm -hmm. put in your image and predict the next image? Mm -hmm. So there's always a, the question of what do you want to get out of a model. Uh, but in principle, there's nothing that speaks against it. So what we also tested, so I, I said, so for example, these functions f, you can also replace them by neural nets. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, for me, it's, all these things are just a question of how you parameterize your model. Mm 
they can take. Yeah, I mean, network. there's people trying to do that now, right? To Once you have the neural network, trying to understand what rules it understood. Yeah. But that's a different approach, I, I agree with you. Yeah, but so the, the space where I like to work, and I think where, where these type of approaches, um, I mean, so first I closer related to, I mean, how I was brought up, where you actually, you know, think about models and so on. But um, the other thing is, so if you think more about these structured um, transformations and so on, so you, if you have not an infinite amount of data available, and I think this is where the space where we can exist. And then there's a space where you have infinite, quasi-infinite amount of data, and then you do brute force AI. Yeah, maybe I missed it, but uh, in the case of the C-STARS embryos, hmm? do you only show the real part of the frequency, not the decay rate? Yeah, yeah. So uh, is, is there, is there? Yeah, we have these, these plots also, so I can. I can. Ah, okay, so it's also something that's. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, you can get all this because you fit basically in one go. So, uh, yeah. There's not nothing specifically dif dif different. No, I mean the DMD, so, so the way it's constructed, I mean it's not an algorithm we came up with. It's just, I think, useful in that case. So if you use a DMD approach, so you get also the real and imaginary part of the algorithms uh, as uh, the, the signal, basically, the frequencies. Yeah. Okay, um, let's thank uh, Jörg and all the speakers.